So this presentation is about how to test Ajax applications. Ah, uh, yeah, one basic thing about our presentation. Um, don't bother, you can always interrupt us with questions, but don't be surprised, we, we aim to, uh, <coughs> to interrupt you with plenty of questions as well. So we, we're trying to make it really interactive, not only between the two of us, but hey, half of our presentation is you. We, don't, we wouldn't have enough slides to fill the whole slot without you. That's, that's basically Marcus's polite way of saying, don't sleep throughout the presentation. We're gonna, we're gonna ask you questions. I thought you're going to blame me now that we don't have enough slides. But <laughs> so, so what's the difference? Why, why, why is there a talk how to test HX applications? Why isn't there a talk how to test software? I think there are books about how to test software. There are probably no books about how to test HX. So what, what's really the difference? So for me, there is quite a few differences that make it specifically hard to test HX applications. So one of them is I'm having some multiple components, some, some running in the client, some running somewhere in the front end, some in the back end. They all com communicate with each other somehow, but it's very hard to get a grip on this communication. One of the reasons is that execution is widely asynchronous. So there is many threads going on at the same time, callbacks from one thread to the other, which makes it absolutely hard to predict client-server communication. If it is hard to predict communication, it's also hard to judge is this going right or not. It's hard to mock out a component that acts like a server and gives stuff to the client when he expects it. Then the other thing is my client is usually running in a browser there are a few big browsers out there. I don't know which one will my customer use. Each browser is behaving slightly different, although there are some better than others. We are having various locales, locales where our application will be run. At, at the end, this means if I want to capture all of that in my tests, I would end up with many and very complex test environments, be it now physical machines or virtual machines, whatever. So it's kind of exploding. So just a small example that we used or that we will use for the rest of our talk is we came up with a very simple, trivial GWT application. Who knows what GWT is? Okay, that's roughly 10%. Come on. So GWT, you really, you know, if you don't know GWT yet, the rest of the 90%, go to code.google.com and look for the Google Web Toolkit. It's a very interesting way to write HAC applications. Basically, it offers you a quite complete framework. You can write, specify your application in nice, neat Java code and then compile it down to JavaScript for execution in the browser. Um, of course, there are some things that need improvement, but I think it's better than nothing. I would rather advertise it than tell you not to do it. So for us, important GWT application, is it important that it is GWT? Nah. It's important that it's an Ajax application. So basically that is copy and pasted from my web browser. I'm having on the left a kind of a tree control that allows me to apply filters. Here I'm having whatever it is, chefs, desks, engineers, quite some <laughs> mixture between items and staff or whatever. And on the right, obviously I have location, product, stock, so how many Chefs, do I have a Mountain View? It's 65, I could increase it or decrease it, probably by pushing these buttons. What else can I do here? This looks like I could apply a filter per location, so I want only to see Mountain View, Zack, let's go away with that. The minuses here show me I might probably be able to add or re remove something or to collapse and expand it. And what you can't see here, but believe me, it is in the real application. If I click on the header, I can actually change the sorting order. Pretty awesome, isn't it? <laughs> That's our high-end application for you. <laughs> so what, what kind of use cases could we think of here? That, I mean, it's a simple, straightforward application. I think, for me, there are three use cases. So. Um, probably the most important one is to increase or decrease the number of items or persons that I'm having somewhere. The next one would be to apply or remove a filter on this side. And finally, of course, I'm just curious how many chefs do I have in Mountain View, so I just want to see that. It's querying. Now, how should we test that? 
So this is interesting, right? Um, by the way, a <clears throat> few things. Notice Marcus's choice of uh, column name product for chefs and engineers. Um, uh, and, those, and those are not real numbers. So uh, you, you mentioned tests, which is, which is exciting. So you know, I'm jumping in because you know, it's a testing conference. That's why we're here. So we need to test this application, right? Um, and Marcus just walked us through a few use cases that we can use to test the application. So this is the part where I'm going to test your caffeine content right now. Uh, I need help. So we want to test this, um, this grid application. What are some of the test cases we can think of? Be sure, we are having three slides full of examples. And before you list it, all of them, we are not going to go to the next slide. So. <laughs> yes. Start with none of the filters selected. Verify there's nothing on the right. Select one filter. Verify that you have only that term in the location column. Select the other filter. Verify you have both. Remove the first. Verify it goes away. Excellent. So we have uh, a set of test cases that are based on filters adding, removing, and collapsing them, and seeing the effect on the UI as well as uh, what that results is in terms of the, the products, OK? What happens if I set a number to the item to zero? Does that line go away? I love that. When we had uh, uh, you know, the, the talk in the morning actually talk about something very similar. We're testers. We love putting negative numbers, right? So either, put it, either make it empty or put it negative or some kind of value that doesn't make sense. What happens? Does the line just disappear? It's a good test case. Sorry, can you repeat that? Excellent. So two users, different browsers, one user changes the value. What happens to the user's uh, UI in the first browser? Floating point numbers and fractions. So changing, so setting a certain sort order and then checking to see if adding and removing filters affects that sorting order. OK, we've got to keep going, because like Marcus said, we have to finish off those two slides. That's a very good test case. If you put more chefs than engineers, what happens then? <laughs> I can tell you what happens to the Google stock. <laughs> OK, so find out how many numbers can actually fit in one of these text boxes here and put in letters instead. I saw some hands go over there. So we have uh, boundary conditions for each of these values because they are numbers, and you can check either end, positive and negative, and seeing the effect on, uh, on, the, on the order about whether you can increase more or less. If it doesn't disappear when you put in zero, does the down arrow go away? Or but, go out, or? So visual indication about the values in these fields where if you make it zero, does the down arrow disappear? Or if it's a really high number, does the up arrow disappear, and vice versa? Excellent. So uh, a, a very good test case would be sorting, sorting, sorting by stock and then modifying the value in one of the items to be 0, such that the, the column needs to be sorted. Does it happen automatically? Set the uh, stock value to JavaScript alert. Wow. That's what I was really looking for. So set the stock value for one of the fields to be a JavaScript alert. Okay. Let's try someone else, yes. <laughs> change the font? You know, here's a, use the mouse and change the font. Uh, sure. So uh, using the mouse, you can change the font size in your browser. Yes? Um, just set the value in the field to a quote, and then a semicolon, and then an arbitrary piece of SQL. There you go, SQL. <laughs> One of our favorites, huh? OK. Try to copy and paste values in and out of boxes. Copying and pasting values in and out of boxes? Back and forth. I mean, who doesn't love doing that in browsers, right? And seeing weird errors and exceptions. Right at the back. There you go. So drop JavaScript and see what happens. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Mozilla with a lot of add-ons. Add who doesn't like that, right? Of course, Slack will get a really heavily loaded browser and then see what happens to your application. I saw another hand at the back there. Yes. Different languages and locales. Very good. 
We're getting good. Now you guys are actually getting warmed up here, man. This is nice. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Turn off JavaScript in the browser and see how it breaks. Yes, we heard that one. Yes, at the back. Okay, so use W gets to post nonsense values to the to the uh, boxes there. Do you think we're sort of covered with our test cases? Um, we're doing pretty well, yeah. Okay, so we still have some more to go. No, let, let's make a short pylons now, okay? Okay. So, how many test cases do you have? Just a ballpark. So, I mean, there are too many to count them. I know. Right. So I, I I really like the the response. I mean, we got lots of different workflows and scenarios that we were covering. Um, I'd say, you know, let's let's just take some number here. Do you think we'd have 20 tests? Does that sound about right? Higher? 30? 40? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, but let's get the number first. I just want to make sure from, from, from comfort level, like we're trying to cover this application with tests, right? We want to make sure it's done. Um, is 100 too high? No. Say what? Several hundreds. Wow. Okay. So we're going to have a couple of hundred tests. Um, that's, that's probably going to be a lot of tests. But OK, there you go. So, so that's, that's our consensus. It's a couple of hundred tests. That's a pretty much tests. So I, I guess some of them will be pretty easy and pretty cool to automate. Absolutely. Well, what kind of percentage you think of these several hundred can you automate? What do you think? What's your tool? Um, you choose it. So you something that's driving my client, obviously, is Selenium or WebDriver or... It's almost close to 100% of those tests. Is there anything that cannot be automated over here? Those are some of the, some of the more difficult ones are turning off JavaScript in the browser, uh, maybe even languages, depending on how your browsers are configured. So it seems like, from a consensus, we have quite a few, like I would say in the order of hundreds of tests that are actually going to be automated um, oh, using, is, using some magic framework that we have. That is cool. Like, <laughs> I'm really impressed, you know. So there are, let's just assume you're the, okay. our software engineer in test, our automation engineer. Okay. So how long will it take you until, I, until you're done with that? Okay, so uh, now I'm trying to guesstimate a little bit. We have lots of test cases that we've got to cover. They have to be all automated, pretty much 100% uh, automated here. Uh, I'm guessing you're going to have some amount of setup. So the, the fr we're going to have to build some kind of framework that's going to run this. We're going to have this framework do setup of the environment, bring up the database, bring up the system, then bring up our automated framework. Everything's going to test end to end. I'm guessing, and correct me if I'm wrong here, guys, I'd say about a week's worth of work to write the framework and build the tests. Good? Does that sound right? More? Sounds mo more than that or less than that? A month? <laughs> I think I heard three months. Was I, I, heard, I heard someone say three months. Okay. That sounds good. So we, we have a proposal to have a developers write the tests as they're building the features so that there's no time to actually write the tests. Uh, do we hear something else? <laughs> That's a good point. Did we have? Performance testing, okay. So I think uh, w this is something that we wanted to, we should be touching upon, but I think we want to focus at least on the functional side, which because Let's, that's definitely yeah. going to be a different ball, ball game of its own. So I, I think that out. going through our test plan, and now let, let me play the bad card. I'm your boss. I want to figure. I want to hear how long, All right, how much so time do you I'm, need. I'm going to commit on, on behalf of everyone over here. I'm going to say I think three months is way too long because I want to be really aggressive and get this done in a month. So that's the amount of time I'm going to take, take to actually author all this stuff. So but it's all authored and done. Okay, I, I'm satisfied with that. I'm settling back. I think you are overly optimistic, but hey, hey that's a stretch goal then. <laughs> <laughs> so on, on the next side, now we are having several hundred of test cases um, run by some in browser automation tool. How long will the turnaround for your automation suite be? How long will it take for you to test the product? What do we think? Minutes? Fifteen minutes? Distributed or inline? Well, it's 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 our choice. We have to make it the best possible, right? Distributed however long your longest test is. Okay. So however long our longest test is. But you know, let's be realistic here. I mean, we tried shooting for a month, which is aggressive. Assuming we can pull that off, what's the best time frame we can expect for these tests to run in some sort of continuous cycle? Fifteen minutes, does 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 an hour sound too much? It sounds, it sounds too much for a cycle. It's probably going to be faster than that. Half an hour? 
Faster than that? 15 minutes? Are we allowed to distribute across servers? I guess you should be able to. That was my next question. That's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting point, because all we talked about is execution. We didn't talk about troubleshooting, which is very interesting. So, Sorry, not running? So long running concurrency tests, I think they fall in the same bucket as the, um, the performance tests, the loaded performance tests. We're trying Wait to measure things on the same level. But so. There was one test case actually that we accepted saying we decrease it in one and we'll see what happens in the sure. other browser. That's, it's, it's still a valid test case. I mean, I guess the long running part of it would, would extend into LNP side of things. But sure, concurrency is a factor. So, so now again, let's, let's I know stop Marcus, the discussion. I, I, I think Marcus is going to push me for getting a number. So I'm going <laughs> to commit yet another number and I'm going to say 15 minutes is a comfortable time. That's I can fine. get you That's all these fine. test cases automated. So thank you, John. I'm happy I'm, we all have the figures you told us on video. So <laughs> <laughs> now let, let's go back. So this, we, we all agree. Like if the applications we would be working with would be that simple, we would have an easy life or no jobs, no. <laughs> so let, let's think about our real life experience and I'm really a curious person. I want to pull some stats from you. So how many of you are having like a few hundred large tests that you have to take care of? That sounds, that looks like 10%. It's about 10%. Um, so the rest have more or less? <laughs> Rather, how many have more? This is all Ajax, right? This is, um, let, let's, let's, not, just, let's not stick for, for that question. So for your general application, how many large tests or really full system tests are, are you owning? Are, are you supposed to take care of or are you supposed to run? So let's start at the bottom. Let's ask how many, who, who, has, who has none at all? Come on, there's got to be someone. Okay, so all of us are testing professionals. That, that is good. <laughs> so who has like more than 50? Oh my God, so many people have less than 50 system tests. That's the assumption we're making that the rest of you guys have <laughs> got less than 50 tests, which is pretty good, okay. Okay, so who is, is in, in, the, in the hundreds? We know already of those in the hundreds, who is, let's say, in the 500 plus range? So I think it's probably half of the people who were in the hundreds. So, and who is in the 1,000 plus range? The same. Minus one. <laughs> Big tests, tests. So, so it's about five percent. I would say is at the one thousand. I would say about ten percent is between one hundred and thousand, and the third is more than fifty. That, that's about what I see. So, sounds about the right distribution. Okay. So, out of those people who who own large tests at all, how many of your tests are flaky? Where I mean, you execute them twice, and once they pass, and once they fail. <laughs> so you, you have some. So who has any flaky tests? Okay. So more people who have tests have flaky tests. So pretty many of them. How often are, are you running your tests? So let, let's say who is running his tests every hour, at least every hour. Okay, that's about 10% again. At least, let's say, um, once per day. I would say the majority, probably 50%, um, who is running them um, more, less than daily, but let's say at least weekly. A few more hands, and who is running them less frequently than weekly? So a few people are running them less frequently than weekly, but I think the majority is at the daily test execution, which is good, hey. But very few of you actually run the tests on an hourly basis. That's another thing. So time to feedback from the test to the programmers might be longer than we want it to be. So how complicated is it to run them? Sorry, yeah? You seem to be omitting the case of selectively running tests. Mm -hmm. Running all of the smoke tests in 30 seconds and then running the tests that relate to the feature you're working on and then once an hour running the full regression suite. What about that? Sure, sure, but that is, in principle, my question was, an hourly execution. So if you run the regression suite once an hour, you are still in the hourly execution. But so do you think there's an advantage to running selected subsections of the test? So I, I, so I think that is 
sorry for the short interruption. So I think it is a very good question, and, and you have the right to interrupt us. <laughs> so I, I think there is value to it, but I think it is a symptom. It is a symptom of having a regression suite that takes far too long to execute. Once I am going down that road and I'm having that problem, yeah, sure, that fast smoke test suite will help me. But it's probably still a state that I don't want to get in voluntarily. Make sense? Cool. Now that we already interrupted, anyone else? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so the question is about um, executing the test every time you have a check-in. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you're right. So executing them more often than your code base changes doesn't really make sense. I, <laughs> I did implicitly assume that there is a, there are continue, there is a continuous stream of check-ins. You're right at that. Probably the question is, who of you could, given that there are so many changes, have that execution? You're, you're right. That's, it's a good corner case that you found. Further questions at that point? I guess not. I think we okay, let's continue our collection of statistics. Um, so how complicated is it to run them where complicated is very hard to measure? Subjective, so yeah. Who of you has a fully automated execution system and never ever needs to bother about test execution at all. They just run. It's running in the background, you guys just look at results, that's it. And they're quarter? always good. Cool, it's a quarter, about 25%. 25%? That's cool. So who of you has at least to push one button to trigger the test execution? <laughs> <laughs> so out of the, so that's, that's about and, another 25%. And, and that button could be telling someone on your team, go run these tests. So that's <laughs> Out of those who have to push at least one button, who, who considers it a major pain or a task that takes some time to get the, your tests running? One. There are two honest people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> or the rest just want to get through the slides pretty quickly, I think. <laughs> yeah. So the, the other question is, how hard is it to troubleshoot and debug them? And it's very hard now to raise hands. But let's just say a yes, no. So who of you considers that getting a, this test is broken is rather far away from the breakage is fixed now. Half of the audience? A little, yeah, I would say a little more than half as well. OK, cool. Now, how long does it take to de detect a bug that was introduced? So that, that goes with the how hard is troubleshooting. So who, who of you is like time between bug detection and bug fixing, let's say, more than a day? That's a sizable number right there. So yeah, almost the same number that we saw. It's again was. about about the same number. So who is in more than a day? So let's further drill down. Who is in more than three days? No, so you found a bug in the product, you report that bug. How long will it take until the developer says it's fixed? No. <laughs> so OK. Oh, no, sorry, probably. I think, I think the, the point was, I yeah. think you guys probably got it right the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not counting your developer productivities over here. So that's a different story altogether. What we are saying is the time that the developer introduced yeah. the bug into the code, that's which is right. actually a very interesting point of time, yeah. uh, to the point where you actually de detected it. So how long sorry, did you yeah, say? Sorry, that, that, oh. that was the question. Sorry. So let us rewind the video. And so <laughs> from... The, from the moment when the developer introduces the bug into the code until the moment that your test suite catches the bug, if it catches it, what's the average time spent? So is it like an hour or less? Let's, let's say the average time, OK? So it, I, think, I think we can see there's a few hands going up, and I'm seeing answers ranging from we don't know, which is sometimes valid, to it's going into the order of days a day, probably even three days, before that actually happens. So that's, that's a good point. And, and I'll, I'll sort of pitch in what I feel over here, right? Because the harder it is to actually troubleshoot and detect why the test failed, will probably tell you, will probably expand the time it takes to actually identify when the bug was introduced. Can we talk about the delta from, forget about time it takes to run the automation, no. delta from after you run it that the results are posted. So Absolutely. So um, the time that it takes, the so, time that it takes but, for. But this is not the the frequency of test execution, because it's one thing to write a feature. The next thing is to write the test for that feature. 
then add that test to the automation framework, and then execute it, and then you might catch the bug, which is probably in the case that the dev who is writing the feature is writing the test, it's the same. But if you have a kind of a, let's throw the finished product over the wall and then add the test, it's a different thing. So. Absolutely, and that, that's one that's part of the answer, which is, yeah. which is I, we don't know. In lots of cases, we don't even know that, that delta. So, but, yeah, sure. So, doesn't it also speak to the quality of the test? Right? Because you're saying, if it catches it at all, right? Then it might be a customer reporting that. Absolutely, right? but, but that would kind of even increase the time between introduction and catching. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, I think in short, we're saying it's a long time. I, I think it really what, depends on the kind of test, again, but it's not an easy task, and it's a long time. So I think what that little, besides us getting a lot of insight on how your companies work, the other thing <laughs> <laughs> that we gain from that little collection of statistics is, uh, it, it looks like that simple problem of testing a, an application, an Ajax application, which is really simple, somehow it brought us to a point where we asked some question that, at least for me, they leave an uneasy feeling. I just don't think that we, we really have a good grip on that. You know, if, if my regression suite catches it at all or if it is reported by the customers. So it takes probably a day or, or, or more until after somebody breaks my, my build, it gets fixed. That's probably just problematic. I, won't, I don't want to use the word unacceptable, but it's definitely something we will want to fix. So what can we do about that? And my suggestion is let's dig, dig deeper not only into the problem space of how to test HX applications, but let us dig deeper into our applications themselves. So for a typical GWT application, the reference architecture, at least the, the one that we see every time, is you're having your GWT client running in the browser. You're having somewhere on the server side a servlet that basically doesn't do much but serving the JavaScript to the browser and afterwards intercepting the RPC calls that come back from the client and then forwarding it to some RPC implementation. That one uses some other mechanism. So at Google, we tend to use protocol buffers. The outside world is not yet using protocol buffers, but is on the way to adapt it to communicate with another RPC backend. Usually, these backends might serve different frontends or more than one frontend. And then that front end by itself is using RPC or um, JDBC or whatever to discuss with some data store, which at Google it is very often a big table in the outside world, MySQL database, whatever you want. So having to look at all these boxes, I, I'm wondering many of the, of the bugs that, we've, that we often find and probably even some that our previous tests would have exposed. I'm just thinking about the we make a change in two different clients, what happens? Are probably bugs that are happening here or here. Some are happening only here, but they don't really need to leave that box. Question is, can't we just test each of these things separately? And won't we get more insight from that? So that's a concern. Well, OK, back up a second. You're just talking about unit tests, aren't you? Oh, that's, 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 that's what people think, yeah. But then, no, I don't. So I, I like to think, if, if I'm thinking unit tests, I'm thinking at not so much, I, I'm thinking at how big is my test. If I'm looking at my application, how many parts of the app am I actually exercising in the test? So if you say unit test, that's for me, I'm having here one class, probably even only one method in that class, and I'm looking, does that method fulfill its contract with the outside world? I don't really care whether it's using a database at all. I just want to know if I'm doing this, following that path, am I getting the result that I expect? Even, more, even better, I will try to get rid of all of these ex dependencies to make the tests cheaper and to make the execution faster. I want my devs to basically execute all the small tests whenever they change a single dot in the application. That, that, that works well if the tests execute really fast. So I want to get rid of that. 
Now, most of the tests that we've been talking about before are here, they are large. So you're really having the, the full app running here, and you're making a use case that goes from the client, through the server, through the RPC implementation, down to the data store. So really exercising the full application. That is good, it gives us a great insight, but it also gives us problems. Several hundred tests take us a, at least a month stretch goal, probably more realistic two or three months to implement. Execution, okay, if we are fast, it's 15 minutes. It's still far too long to execute whenever I make a change to the application. So that, that's probably also something I don't want too many of them. And I'm advocating this kind of tests. So I think there might be a feature or a problem or a part of functionality in a certain layer. In our previous diagram, usually the business logic, for instance, might be in the RPC implementation. So if I want to test business logic, why should I bother to have the UI? Why should I bother to have the real database? I just want to test the business logic. Okay, so, so that makes sense. So we talked about large tests, which is basically all the tests that we collected at the beginning. We're not talking about unit tests because those are for individual components. What we're saying is we need to start testing these things at levels and layers, which sort of falls in the medium test bucket. Right, that, that's the whole idea. So if I'm going back now to my previous um, quest, to my previous slide, and I'm thinking of many of the test cases we had before, um, which ones would you put, for instance, here into the backend? What kind of tests should be here? What questions do you want to ask the backend? Any suggestions? Sorry? So we want to check the data integrity. Can I make any calls to the backend that basically leave my data store in an inconsistent state afterwards? Other questions? How else could we test this layer? Just that box there. Just for, just let us think about this layer. Yeah? That is a great point. So what happens if I'm sending an invalid request here? Is the backend just hanging up or is it giving me an error code? Sorry, yes? So what happens if, if I'm making a call here and then I'm destroying this error here? Did I understand that correct? That is hard to automate, but <laughs> <laughs> what, what, you, what you really could do is so you don't really use the real big table. So let's just use a mock here. And I tell that mock, hey, you know, you're going to get a question out. Just don't answer it all. What's happening? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, fault, the, the whole concept of bringing down layers and bringing on connections between layers is exactly the, pa the part that you can do for these kind of tests. What are the tests we have here? This and year? another probably harder to uh, to manipulate thing is what if that guy is getting a malformed reply from here? So if for some reason the packet becomes compromised on its way and it's garbled up when it reaches here. So again, with a mock, fault injection becomes very easy. You have some other questions that you want to ask at that layer? What happens if you delete that table? Right, yeah. What happens if that table disappears? Remember, we had someone who tried a SQL injection attack at some point, so deleting tables is not impossible. Yes? Uh, object explosion. Okay. Can you sort of elaborate on that? Uh, if I make a call from the RPC implementation, if the RPC I back in is based on sort of either object, uh, object model where it's calling the database and basically, you know, uh, creating classes out of that data, to, you know, are we getting to where a single class, class can explode into a whole Mm -hmm. Very good point. Absolutely. Do you have any further suggestions for that layer? Load yeah? Testing. Sorry? Load testing. load testing. That is a very good point. So why should I go all that way for my load tests? Why should I even bother to go this way for my load tests? If I'm having 100 clients talking to a front end, and 10,000 clients talking to the same backend, where would you put your load tests? Or what load tests would you put in what place? 
Maybe these are totally different kind of load tests. Yeah. Right, yeah. So validating business logic and business rules, I guess, at, at that layer. So if you look at the whole thing, we, we've mentioned now quite a few test cases. And let's put one of them out, which was the timeout test case. How long do you think is each of them taking you to execute? One minute. One minute? Any suggestions? Is that too, too long, too short? But, but I said, let's take the timeout out, so all the other test cases. So I think we are talking in the milliseconds thing here, yeah. So in, instead of talking about seconds that we were talking before in the full end-to-end -end tests, we are now talking about milliseconds to execute it, which probably will have an impact on the execution speed of my overall test suite, I think so. John, what do you think? So I think that sounds like quite an improvement because we started off with wanting to cover everything and then we sort of narrowed down and said, okay, let's look at this one layer. But with that one layer, we're actually getting a speed up. Okay, that's, I'm, I'm starting to get convinced that this is probably a good approach. What else do you have in store? Oh, well, I, I think um, after talking about the backend, let's think about the RPC implementation. So can you think of tests that you want to drive against the RPC implementation? Performance testing. Sorry? Performance testing. Performance testing, very good, yeah. Functional testing, so what kind of functional tests can we think of? Validating all the business rules, yeah. Okay. Would we, would we want to talk to the real backend? Probably we want to get rid of most of our communication with the real backend. So how, how can we do that? Any suggestions? We heard mock. Mock, yeah, cool. <laughs> so, so mocking, actually having mocking out an RPC call is one of the easiest things that you can ever do in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I tried it. <laughs> so, so that is really offering itself to mocking out. You are having, the interface for the RPC backend, whatever technology you're using, whether it's protocol buffers or a Java stub, you, you see that interface, you have it right in front of you. You just implement it with something different and you either put it on the same machine where your implementation is running or you put it, you just sneak in your, your Mac on a network address, uh, your, your mock on the Mac network address, oh, it's too difficult, and then tell your implementation to talk to the different network address. Don't even need dependency injection explicitly for that. It's, it's even easier than that. And, and obviously we get speed up that we talked about even earlier with time with this approach. So, but now John, for you, the, the tough job that I want to give to you. I, I think I've been talking for quite a while now trying to convince you guys that this might have some usages in our daily lives. The really tough thing is how, what would you do with the client? Okay. so. We'll try to copy tactics here, right? So we looked at Marcus as a strategy and how he's doing this at, at a bunch of layers. So we started off at this layer, and it seems to be the, the, the mantra here seems to be look at a given layer, look at the, the levels above and below that, and see what can be mocked out by some definition of mock. And so we want to test the client. So what ideas do we have here? So remember, that's the layer pair we're looking at. We're looking at the, the GWT client there. So this is in the browser. What tools are we talking here? What techniques are we talking here? How could we test this? DOM objects. DOM objects, great. So we could have tools that can manipulate the DOM, verify that the DOM is actually in the right state before and after your test. Very good. What else? Fake messages through record and playback, or even interception, storing those messages, because it's HTTP at the end of the day, uh, this is something that should be mockable by some standard. And that's actually a very good technique as well. And again, what we're getting to is, 
you won't really, you won't actually need the real servlet there. You could have something in place of it. Uh, again, given a simple interface, that's something you could very easily mock out. And remember, the goal here again is you're testing the client. Uh, I drive it using any one of my standard UI testing tools that I have. Things that will allow me to manipulate the DOM. Things that will allow me uh, to intercept traffic that's going from the browser to the back end. Um, and use those tools to sort of create an isolated test. Again, you're focusing on medium tests over here. So it's, you, may have, you may be limited in running this as a pure unit test, but it still adds a lot of functionality at the same time giving you speed gains that you would get uh, over your traditional large tests. So I think that fairly covers it at that layer. So you see also what the impact of that ideas are on doing, for instance, browser compatibility testing or on doing localization testing. I know, I know a bunch of us had actually talked about languages and locales. Uh, and now think about us doing those same tests, except that we have a lot of control over what comes, what data is coming to the browser, how we can fake that data, how we can actually intercept that data. And it's especially useful when we want to cover uh, a cross matrix of either platforms, browsers, or languages and locales. The, the other thing here is that, talking again about speed up of my tests, so you will actually be surprised how fast Selenium can suddenly appear, or WebDriver, if you cut back, if you cut off that part here. If you just have communication with a server that is maybe even running on the same machine where your tests are executed, it becomes blazingly fast. Not as fast as our really tests here against the RPC interface, but still surprisingly fast. Uh, well, the other thing is that for here, probably is a very good place to inject our fake RPC implementation for our test. So you might not even have to intercept HTTP calls. Why should you? You just give the, serv the servlet your, your mock server to talk to. And you can very easily do that with any one of the number of different mocking technologies that you could have. Um, even for something like the RPC impl, you could use dependency injection. You can actually, given the interfaces, you can create uh, stunt doubles, as you call them, of these services, which you can inject in, which is excellent because now your same UI tests that would typically take a very long time to run are running fine, and they're testing exactly what they were intended to test, which is the UI, and not everything in the system, at least at that layer. So I've not been totally honest with you saying we are, we're just looking at every box. If you remember these medium boxes that we had on that slide after the architecture, so there was actually one element covered with orange. In one example, it was one box plus the data store. So that already gives you a hint that we might want to test layer pairs together as well. Can you think of any reason why we would want to do something crazy like that? I thought we were actually done with testing them individually, so that's actually a good question. Why should we be testing these in layer pairs now? Communication between layers, okay, we didn't actually verify that, so that's a good point. We heard something else. So you testing integration between those layers? Limitations on how much you can mock, um, and even possibly mistakes, because again, that, that is code that you're going to write and put in. Sorry? Sorry? Maintenance. Um, elaborate. So, so yeah, right, yeah. depending on how it's actually being modified in the code, maintaining the suite to actually make sure it makes sense, given that there, is, there are changes to layers, you need to sort of make sure that the layers are in sync. Uh, there could be code changes to any one or both of them, okay? So I think here that I, basically all of these questions are, it's the, the test of the box alone is like saying, does it use the other layer the way that I expect it to use it? And does it deal correctly with the replies from the other layer that I expect it to be given? Here we are asking, so the two of them together, do they really understand each other? Or am I just dreaming about it? Now you might think, so, so why bother to mock them out in one test and then using them both together in the other? I think the thought here is, is again for everything that we want to know about the application. We think of the smallest possible test to figure that out, whatever it is. So if I want to know is the business logic correct, I'm running a battery of tests against that component that implements the business logic and nothing else. 
If I want to figure out is component A communicating correctly with component B, it is a totally different kind of question which might also have different test cases and maybe less test cases than the other question has. So always think of what is now the smallest possible test that helps me figuring it out. Everything that I don't need to get that answer to that question, I'm mocking out recklessly. If I want to know whether RPC implementation is talking correctly with RPC backend, do I need the servlet? Barely. Do I need the, R the, the big table on the other side? Nah, we don't need it. We, we just jump in after the servlet and we mock out the big table. And we have just what we wanted. So this actually sounds really good. So we started off with um, you know, defining what these tests look like. We actually broke them down into layers and we've tested them in isolation. We've tested them in pairs. I'm actually feeling really good right now. I think, and I'm gonna sort of you know, switch modes a little bit and say, uh, and say we're, we're done. This is actually good. Are we ready to ship? So what do you think? Are we ready to ship? I don't know, I'm feeling confident. What do you guys think? Is that enough? We just do that and we're ready to go? I mean, we've tested these layers in isolation and pairs. They're exhaustively tested. What about your configuration? Okay, so I'm hearing configuration, end-to-end. Uh, -end. There's something that's missing. Is that true? So people say something is missing. Well, yeah, okay. So last but not the, not the least important. So everything that we told you now was like avoid system tests. Don't do full end-to-end -end tests. We don't really want them. Uh, to be honest, for the dramaturgic effect, we were cheating a little bit. We do want them. What we want is, instead of you writing a few hundred of them, to write 20, 15. Think of a number that makes sense in this small, and then for the whole life of your project, stick with that number. Even for the full system, we have questions that we want to ask and where we really need the system running to work. These questions are not, does a pop-up open if the user clicks on this button? That is something I can test against the pure UI. I don't need the rest. That question is not, is the business logic implemented correctly? We figured that out already. That question is simply, so if I'm putting everything together and I'm starting it up, does it really work or does it immediately stop in each track? If I'm trying to run this function, does it work or does it not work? I'm not caring about boundary cases. I'm not caring about coverage. I'm just figuring out, does the system as, as a whole system really work? So usually one test per use case is sufficient. I've covered all of the boundaries, all of the error scenarios in my, in my medium-sized tests. Now I'm just trying plugging it all together. Will it work, yes or no? If it does, I will be personally pretty confident that the whole thing works, that the whole thing works. So it, it is about getting confidence into the system, really. So now, are we done now? I think we are. I mean, that, that sort of covers pretty much everything, right? We, we, have the, we have the units, we have the medium tests, we have the large tests, we are confident now the system is working end to end. Yes? You just used getting confidence into the system. Yeah. When you're speaking of developer confidence, I agree entirely. But what about customer confidence? Unit tests and pairwise interface, uh, component interface tests don't actually mean anything to the customer. If, your if the entirety of your functional testing is 20 tests, one per use case, how do you build customer confidence? Well, the, the, the question is, what does the customer want? The customer wants a working system. Agreed. So if I'm confident that the system is working, and if I can show to the customer, look, I, I'm confident that the system is working, why am I? I have covered all the boundary cases for our business logic. I have covered all the possible cases for our UI. I've tried out whether the whole thing works together. What else will he want? So how many people here have customers who take their word for it that it's been exhaustively tested? I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm not talking about taking the word for it. I'm saying I can basically come up with a matrix. These are, this is the business logic. I've tested this one exhaustively. I've tested this one exhaustively. I've tested this one exhaustively. I can say, look, this is the UI. I've tried the following use cases against the UI. It works. Actually, builds customer confidence is seeing the entire system work, not just in the sunny day scenario, not just in the clean path, but
but showing them some of the ways it responds to anomalous inputs and failure. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not hearing much of what the customer wants to see, just of what, how the customer wants it to behave. I think you need to show them that too. So I think, I think there's a place for additional acceptance testing and functional testing so, to build that customer confidence. Which, which, which I think is, is probably a valid point in the sense that we should I think we should, this, this probably merits even a longer discussion, but I'm glad that we actually brought that up because that's the kind of response we want to get. We want people to come up with these kind of ideas. I think in the interest of time, because we're probably running out of time, we should uh, get done with the slides. Yeah. So, so we should talk yeah, about this We, we after should the pick talk. that up again. So I, I do personally think um, I'm driving over any bridge in the United States, although I haven't watched them being built and tested. So I'm confident enough. I'm confident enough to fly an airplane without having it seen built and, te and tested. So I think the question of what do we have to do to make the customer confident is kind of breaking down an engineering problem into a social problem. I think once we solve the engineering problem, the, sol the social problem will go away. So now, but, but I'm grabbing in the next break. I, I really like to continue that discussion. So if, if we look at it all, let's compare the two things that we have done before. And hey, because you started off suggesting all these end-to-end -end tests, you are red now. So probably it was a bad idea doing all those big, nasty, long, drawn, end-to-end -end tests with all those different scenarios through the, through the, we were kind of testing only through the GUI, which is sort of where we were driving the whole point. And it seems pretty obvious that they were both, I mean, they were expensive, uh, limited insight, and sort of all the negative points that we talked about that a lot of us over here as testers face with our test suites today. Uh, they suffer from problems, uh, whereas it seems like going beyond that, um, where we actually decided to say, let's not just start with the problem from the UI, let's start at it from, a, from an individual component perspective, building up confidence to the layers and layer pairs, and then finally wrapping up with you know, a final GUI test. That sort of seems like the right approach if you compare the two now. So yeah, conclusion is beyond that what John already delivered now. So I think the approach that was outlined in green, so looking at the architecture and making smaller tests, um, will bring you to have faster tests. You can begin testing earlier. So if, if you're not in the happy position that you really can push all the um, writing of tests to your devs, which I think would be the ideal state, but I know the ideal world is a place that is quite far away. Um, still, we can basically we can begin writing our tests much earlier. I don't have to wait for a stable user interface. I can start working once the RPC backend has a stable interface which typically happens much earlier than people agree about the user interface. Um, I would argue I have reduced ma maintenance of my test suite. Why do I say that? I think if I'm executing my tests continuously, probably on each submit of a change to the, to the code, I'm detecting problems much earlier. And the social problem of pushing the maintenance to the person who actually broke the tests becomes much easier solvable than if I'm getting a feedback report one day later. Localization of problems is easier. So I'm not having one test that covers all of my boxes and when it's broken, I'll have to go and debug it. I have one test against one box. If it's broken, I know 99% likelihood that the defect is in that box, probably even higher. The other thing it just could be in our mocks. Execution is easier, so it becomes a no-brainer to integrate your test suite into the continuous build. And of course it is cheaper, so I probably don't have to think so much anymore about how many machines do I need to parallelize it, which, let's be honest, so we are decreasing the time cost by parallelizing the test execution. We are not decreasing the overall cost. We just keep that one constant. We are just better, getting better in hiding it. Yeah, so that, that is probably my final point. I, I actually think, agree, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of convinced now. We started, we started off a different level, but we're in agreement. That sounds like a good approach. Hey, considering that we got you right off the lunch, you were a brave audience. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have some three, four minutes left for questions. Is that okay? Okay. So I'm spending a significant percentage of my time working on Gmail now. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess yes. <laughs> so you want to reduce that 50,000 test steps, is that what I'm hearing? 
so I, I think, and it's not only me, I, I think um, we have many engineers, um, very good engineers in Gmail who are trying to change our testing approach there, right. and we are right on track. We are doing some very interesting stuff there. Yes? So if I summarize the question is, I'm having in my interface many functions that I might not even use it. Um, testing this function might yield to false positives because why, why, why should I test them at all if I don't need them in my product? So my, my answer to that would be, why are these functions in the interface? Drop them. So, so what you're you're talking now about using APIs that are provided by third party? Yes. Well, well, there there you have to draw a line. No, I, I mean I, if I'm writing my, soft, my if I know for instance my server is going to run on Linux and it is using some of the system APIs, some system calls, I'm not going to test that. So I, I have to draw my line somewhere and saying this is my line of trust or my line of caring. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So I guess you're advocating for your, you know, doing unit tests at each one of the components you have instead of doing just UI tests. But you know, there's there's a big trade-off in terms of how much time and maintenance you have to put there. What's uh, from your experience? What's a good hybrid approach um, where you can you can test as less as you can with the biggest impact you know, and, and effort? From our side, it's more like. So the question was, um, you know, given that we're advocating these three levels of tests and there's significant work, I mean, obviously it is, it is an activity, so it's going to take time. Um, how do you actually decide where you're supposed to be spending your time given that each of these is an expensive activity? I think a lot of people in the audience actually brought it up, and this is maybe a good time to reiterate that, and that is um, if test is not thought about as an after step or something that happens later, then none of these activities will actually be expensive in terms of your time planning. Um, unit tests, I think pretty much everyone agrees is, is something we need to have, we must have. But think about when you actually write these tests. I think with every line of code that goes in without a test, the cost to actually write the test, test is significantly higher. And this starts multiplying as the layers go up you know, higher and higher. So um, having people write each of these tests and deciding the breakup of what makes sense for your product uh, is something that's, that's different. So for instance, in, in our products at Google, uh, teams may have their own split in what they think is the right number of unit tests or the right number of medium tests and the right number of large tests. And you may have to decide the number for yourself. I think the only takeaway would be uh, by introducing that as an activity with your development cycles, all these kinds of tests can be reduced in terms of cost for both uh, development as well as uh, maintenance. I don't know if that specifically answers your question, but yes. Sorry, that, that's probably the very last question. Now I, I got a oh, signal got, like this okay. from Lydia. <laughs> so I think that's the last. We have one time for one last question. One last question. You, sir. So I. So giving correct figures out is always like being one leg without a job. So I won't do that. Um, I, I don't think that Gmail is an example where it doesn't work. So I think Gmail is actually a very good example where we were stuck at at this extreme until very recently, 
And since then, many people have invested a lot of time and hard work to move it here. I would think Gmail is on track to become a success story for what we are advocating. And we are really doing, we are really moving quite fast into, into the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can't talk about Gmail here. I can talk about another project that I've been working on for in the past, where we followed, for instance, this approach right from the beginning, where we were basically once development was set, put away the keyboard and said we are done, we were ready to release in 30 minutes. I guess that was I see, it I'm with sorry, the last but question. You know, we are, we are, we are staying around. So if you have any further questions, Please just grab us, us in the, bring a coffee and grab us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.